Good evening, everyone, and we are back in Jeremiah chapter 3. We are continuing on from verse 23, but just for a brief recap, if you remember when we started in chapter 3, uh, it was an appeal that God was actually attending to the, the way that the northern kingdom had behaved uh, and gone away to worship idols and thereby, God gave this depiction or description that he actually divorces uh, the northern kingdom. And if you remember, the idea of divorce is not the modern idea, but the ancient idea of putting away or sending her away and to formalize it by even a, a, a letter or a certificate of cutting off meaning that relationship is going to come to an end. Now, we have read all of these, but more importantly is the surprising appeal by God that although he had done the, the worst-case scenario of setting Israel apart, and that would be the northern kingdom, and uh, because the northern kingdom had gone on to worship our idols, the southern kingdom, on the other hand, was doing the same in a what they call a treacherous mode, meaning under the covers they are doing all these idolatry, but on the above, on the external, pretending that nothing happened. And, and God says Israel or the northern kingdom is more righteous because Judah, seeing it and looking at all the, uh, the, the catastrophe that, came upon the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom didn't even change their mind. And hence, that was how God viewed them all. But as it went down from verse 6 all the way down to verse 22, we actually see God appealing to both the northern and the southern kingdom to repent. More so the northern kingdom, because the southern kingdom hasn't been taken away or destroyed yet by the enemies. But the northern kingdom had been taken away. So they are no longer called the kingdom of Israel. They are merely now referred to the house of Israel or the house of Jacob. And being a house, they may have been dispersed, but they nevertheless remain as a, a corporate entity, and that God is calling all of them to repent. Backsliding here keeps us abreast to know that this is actually the turning away. And then we have the other word that is to return, which is shuv, it is to turn back turn back to the original. Now, these are the juxtapose or the play of words that we can't actually capture very much in the English, but it's there in the uh, Hebrew. Now, this, we continue on to verse 22. Now, we, we ended in verse 22, and so I just want to point you back to the word return. And in verse 22, return is to shuv. And, and this I, other word, shovav, uh, is turning away, right? Turning away. And the other word, which is uh, meshuva, uh, it is the turning away. So these two words are similar words, away and back. And so I just wanted to point out to you that God is using similar words. And in Hebrew, the words are derived from the root word, shuv. And this is to turn back. And these other two is what we are to avoid. That is to turn away from God and to acknowledge that you are the Lord, our God. Moving on in verse 23, connecting to where we left off, truly in vain. So the other idea here is truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills, from the multitudes of mountains, 
you see this is another A and B. This is the emphasis of the high places. The high places is where idolatry is practiced. And so it is really saying that in the high places where the multitude, the roar of the multitudes, the, the, they, are, they are worshiping God, uh, the idols there, uh, it is of no use. It is of no use. The other word here is vain. And this would be disappointment. Disappointment. And so the idea here is the worship of idolatry with regards to the high, high places is a disappointment. It's a deception. Meaning they, they think it is real, but in actual fact, it is a deception. They are deceived. And so the, the, the framework that it ends up in verse 23 is um, truly or surely in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. And by salvation, it's the teshuva, the deliverance. Now, just, just take a moment to reflect on this. At this point in time, the northern kingdom is already taken away. But yet they are all dispersed and yet God calls them to return. That they are backsliding, they're going away, they're doing idolatry. It's not what God wants and wants them to come back and calls him father. And verse 23 literally tells us that salvation or deliverance is in Yehovah, our God. He is the one who punished them and he will be the one to bring them back. Now, the last few verses in chapter 3 speaks about the shame. We lie down in shame, for our shame has devoured us. And, and, and the reproach covers us. All of these are speaking about the shame that is useless. The shame, how should we say? The, 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 the shameful things that they have done. The shameful things that they have done. And these shameful things that they have done is idolatry, to trust in idols. And you notice, all through the prophet works, the, the appeals and, and the messages from the minor and major prophets and now reading in from the book of Jeremiah, you, you will notice a pattern and, and, and you find that idolatry has has a an appeal to repentance, right? And the 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 the, the solution is repentance. It is not in any other form, and they realize their shame, and they realize that we have sin. And this word is chata, and it is to miss. Against the Lord our God, we and our fathers, even our youth, even till today, have not obeyed the voice of our Lord our God. All of these is done while watching the northern kingdom being taken away. And the southern kingdom may realize their shame. And that's that's the, the, the picture that's being portray. If they realize their shame, what are they supposed to do? Uh, I think we're all very clear. Uh, it, it is about repentance. Without repentance, God will not save them or, in other words, deliver them and bring them back to the land. As you notice, uh, it continues on to chapter 4. And God continues appeal to them. Now you find that 
passages in Jeremiah is extremely long. And that's the unique characteristic of the book of Jeremiah, making the book of Jeremiah the longest of all prophets. Watch the conditionals, and I think that all of us knowing, uh, understanding English, and if you know a bit of law as well, that the word if is conditional. If you do this, then something will happen. And so it says, if you will return, O Israel, says the Lord, Return to me. And the word return right here is the repentance, the shuv. As I mentioned, the solution for idolatry is repentance. If you return to God, says the Lord. And then another if. If you will put away your abominations out of your sight. Out of my sight, sorry. Abominations as in the book of Exodus, refers to idols. And it's an abomination. It's a disgusting thing to God. Idols are nothing, really. It has no life. But yet, Israel, or the known kingdom, worships them and serves them. And Judah, the southern kingdom, hides their, their idolatry. And God says, even though they are nothing, it takes their faith and confidence away from the real God of Israel. Now, if you do that and return to me and put away abomination. So you just can't turn around and say, oh, God, I'm coming back while holding on to the idolatry on the other hand. Only then shall you not be moved. You shall swear. The word swear is kind of unique in Hebrew, it's Shava. And it is to say something seven times. And the Lord lives. The Lord lives means Hai Yehovah. And this is, let me just write down, Hai Yehovah. This is this phrase. And it says, as the Lord lives seven times. And this is the kind of oath that you cannot break. Because you're making an oath to God. So this is not something to be done in a flippant manner. As long as God lives, and, and we know that as a phrase, God is, uh, God, God, uh, he was, he is, he is to come. He is the ever living God. Achieh, Asher, Achieh. You find that in the book of uh, Exodus chapter 3, the name of God. If anyone makes this oath, as the Lord lives, Hi Yehovah, in truth, judgment, and righteousness, say what is in confidence, knowing the judgment that comes when it's broken, and saying the right things. When Israel does all these, what is going to happen? That would be returning to God here and putting away abominations. It reflects a testimony. And this is what it says. The nations shall bless themselves in him and in him shall they glory. Uh, you find that the nations here, in verse 2, refers to Goyim. And typically refers to the non-Israel nations. And so when, when Israel turns back, the whole world will see a miracle. It, and this, I believe, would be a supernatural miracle. And they will, they will bless bless themselves and in this way it would be to to say good things in themselves with regards to God and they will glory in the Lord and this whole phrase is an A and a B is to place place their hope in God now, I think we have read the book of Isaiah chapter 2. 
where the nations of the world will stream to the mountain of the Lord. And, and, and these will be indications of the, the latter days, I would say, a future prophetic word that when the northern kingdom, remember, the northern kingdom is the 10 northern tribes, will return to God. Now, when they were taken away by the Syrians as the Judah, the, the southern kingdom watched, um, they never came back, even till today. And when the southern kingdom was taken away, they came back. And so we'll look at that. And the existence of Israel, as we see today, is not the fulfillment of chapter 4 and uh, verses 1 and 2. Uh, that will be sometime in the future. Verse 3. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem. And now what you can see is you can see a change in the audience or, or attention of audience. Thus says the Lord. God is speaking. And, and that's something which... Uh, well, the, the Jews and those of us who read the Old Testament should, should pay attention. That's what God is saying. Uh, in our days, uh, in, in our country, when the king speaks, it's published uh, as a press release. And that's what the king says. And, and people are expected to listen and not argue about it. But here when God says, this is what I'm saying to Judah and Jerusalem, uh, we we should even, we shouldn't even disagree with God. And the, this refers to our focus on, on the greatness, uh, on, on who God is, that every word he says, thus says the Lord, makes it important for us to understand and comprehend. And God says, break out your fallow ground. Uh, this, this is important. Brick up here is to till. Your fallow ground. Fallow ground is uh, untilled or tillable. What does that mean? Um, it means that it's, a, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's an idiom. Uh, it is a, a manner of speaking to Judah and Jerusalem that they, they still have hope, right? They still have hope. Meaning their ground, their hearts are still tillable, meaning they can still break up the ground and tells them, do not sow among thorns or thorn bushes. Basically, if you are into agriculture, uh, there is no way to sow among thorn bushes because you cannot harvest. It is useless. And so God tells them, break up your tillable ground, uh, your hearts that can understand. Right? Now, the next few verses, the next verse is in verse 4, is about circumcision. The idea of circumcision, not the physical circumcision, they are circumcised, the men, but it says, circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your hearts. This is another A and B. This is about removal of foreskin. But in actual fact is the dependence on the flesh. And the dependence on God himself, right? That this would be a no and this would be a yes. And so the idea here is circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Take away or remove. This is the word remove. The foreskins of your heart. See, you don't have foreskins in the heart. Uh, and, and circumcision is about removing foreskin and removing the dependency of the flesh. So it's symbolic in that sense. But more interestingly is it's with regards to the hearts. 
In Hebrew, besides referring to the organ that pumps blood in, in our body, hearts is the seat of the will. That you should make decisions sensitized to God. That you should not be stubborn when you do things. Listen to God. And that's, that's the, the, the thing. Break up your fallow ground. Break, make it loose so that you can plant things. That the ground can, can, can give nutrients to what you want to sow. Not the thorn bushes. Circumcise yourselves. So this is an A and B. Uh, circumcise yourselves. Remove the foreskins. Don't be stubborn. Listen to God. That, that would be the appeal. You men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. This is an A and a B. Speaking to the same people. Lest. The... I actually, the, the idea here is, uh, is to beware, right? Beware that the fury, the anger of God, the fury, in, in this case, what fury uh, literally means the 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 hot rage of God. I think that would be a good way. The, the fire or the flames of, of rage. Would that be a, yeah. The fire of rage. So God's fire of rage. I think this would be a very intense imagery that it will come forth uh, like fire. Right? So this is the fire of rage. It will come back, come in like a fire, and, and it will burn so that no one can quench it. Uh, basically, it will burn like, like fire burn. It will be kindled. It will consume. And no one can quench it or put it out. And this is what I think we should see the anger of God. Once unleashed, you would see things which you do not want to see. Once unleashed, things that happen that you don't wish ever will occur. And, and in this case, as God is appealing to the people of Judah and Jerusalem, they don't realize that what happened to the northern kingdom that they saw can happen to them as well. Why would this anger come? Because of the evil of your doing. Deeds will be what is done. And evil is Ra, right? Evil is Ra would be the Things that are that are disagreeable to eyes of beholder. And in this case, God. So what is God displeased of? The things that he's he doesn't want them to do, uh, like idolatry. And God wants them to repent, come back. You are still teachable. You still have hope. Take away the foreskins of your hearts. Remove the stubbornness of your will. Unless you are not careful, the fire of rage of God will come and burn until no one can stop it and it will consume everything in the pond. And the reason is this. You cannot blame God for that. Continuing on this appeal, declare, report, tell Judah and Jerusalem. So this is an A and a B, same group of people to be receiving this message. Blow the trumpet in the land. That would be a shofar. 
the horns, uh, the, the, the ram's horns or uh, of uh, other animals as well. This is to call attention. And then one is blow, one is cry. Gather together and say, assemble yourselves. Well, these are the same idea, assembling. When you talk about blowing the trumpet, call attention. In many cases, it refers to an attention to, to be safe, right? Uh, of, of danger. And when they come together, and this is about danger coming about of enemies, it says, let us go into the fortified cities. And in the olden days, you have people living outside and you have people living inside the walls. And this will be fortified. And so these are people who will run in to stay in there because they are outside and they would not be protected. And they will call for a flag in Zion, right? They are in Jerusalem. We're talking about the same group of people. This will be a flag. And it says, take refuge, do not delay. Because they, if they don't go in, what's going to happen? God says he will bring disaster from the north and a great destruction. The word dis, uh, disaster uh, is about destruction. God is going to bring something that will destroy. Right, that's that's the idea. Something to destroy. And this word north would be far north. And and for our purposes, looking back, and this would be Babylon. And great destruction. The great destruction would be great ruin, right? Great ruin. Completely destroyed and when they see that in verse 7 gives us a picture of the lion coming out of his thicket thicket means uh, the, the, the either the place is hiding or uh it usually is a place of hiding amongst the bushes, right? And the destroyer of nations is on his way. Now, you need to know that this is an A and a B. It's speaking about the same. The destroyer of nations is Babylon. The lion is the picture uh, in Daniel chapter 7, right? I think it's in verse 4 or 5. That the imagery that Daniel had of Babylon is a lion with wings. And so this would be the same. They, they, they come and they destroy. They are powerful and they don't care. He has gone forth from his place. He has left Babylon and he's going to make your land desolate. Your cities laid ways without inhabitant. And you see all of this would be an A, B, and C. Complete destruction this is what God is now telling Judah for this clothe yourself with sackcloth lament and wail now these three components are very important for us to understand sackcloth uh, sackcloth is mesh type of uh, material that they use uh, for holding grain together. Uh, I think it's similar to what we call sackcloth. The second one is uh, to lament, to wail. Lament is actually wail as well, right? Uh, this would be to tear the hair, uh, to beat the breast, 
and that's lament here. Now, the last word is wail would be to howl. And this would be a howl uh, in crying. So we have three things here. One, two, and three. And let me just point out to you that this is a depiction of repentance. God really wants Judah to do that. Because if they actually repent, then the things that is mentioned by God up here about the destroyer, uh, making desolate ways without inhabitant, will not happen because it can turn the fierce anger of the Lord back from us. But if they don't do that, then the fierce anger of the Lord will not turn back from us. And, and, and this is contingent on repentance. It will be contingent on repentance. I think you can read some of this in um, uh, the book of Jonah. Right? Everywhere that you read about repentance, you would find sackcloth, lament, the beating of the breast, the tearing of the hair, the tearing of the clothes, and wailing and howling. And that would be a picture of repentance. Now, we don't seem to see that. But why is God looking at that is because, you remember, repentance can be seen. Repentance is not merely in the heart. Uh, that would be a more of a Greek concept. Repentance is really to turn back and come home. I think that picture would be very much like um, the prodigal son, where the, the son who had went out and, 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 and wasted all the, the, the inheritance decides to go home. And the going home is the repentance. And that's the visual of the Hebrew. And hence, the depiction of repentance of sackcloth, lament, and wail will also be that as well. Now, in verse 9, it says, It shall come to pass that day, or that day, that day would be the day of punishment, the day of judgment, says the Lord. And again, everything that you read says the Lord, let us be very mindful because God is saying something extremely serious. God doesn't joke with his people, right? I mean, we have a lot of idle chatter. God doesn't have idle chatter. And everything he says matters one way or another. And hence, it, it serves us well to really pay attention to God. It says here, the day will come that the heart of the king shall perish, the heart of princes, the priests shall be astonished, and the prophets wonder. And all this depicts that they are turning back is incomplete. Now, in the time of Josiah, you find that Josiah is a great king. He, 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 he learned from the father of uh, Jeremiah uh, that the, the, the scrolls of the Torah was there in the temple and they read the Torah again and they made the land better and people came to serve and worship and sacrifice to God. But it didn't last long because at the end of Josiah's reign, he was killed. In fact, he was probably one of the few, if not the only one, who were killed in battle uh, of the southern kingdom. And that was really unexpected. And this is what it means. All this astonishment, right? In verse 10, and I said, Jeremiah said, Ah, Lord God, surely you have greatly deceived this people and Jerusalem. What do you mean by that, Jeremiah? And the word here is beguiled, right? 
beguile, uh, delude. I, I think misdirect is also a good word. Uh, like the serpent in the Garden of Eden, deceiving uh, the man and the woman. Uh, this is about delusion. It's about misdirect and making them think that you have peace, whereas the sword reaches to the heart. Verse 10, the word heart here is nefesh. That it reaches to the soul. That it will destroy the person. And so why did God, why did Jeremiah think that God has misdirected the people? Actually, God didn't. Jeremiah was thinking, well, the people might be honoring God, uh, reading the Torah, but, but that's not what God wants. If you, if you had followed in the earlier verses, what did God want? The turning back, the repentance. Not the motions of religious ritual. right? Not the motion of religious ritual. Verse 10. And at that time, it will be said to this people and to Jerusalem, a dry wind of desolate heights blows in the wilderness toward the daughter of my people, not to fan nor to cleanse. A wind too strong for these will come for me. Now I will speak judgment against them. And so at that time, that would be judgment. And hence, this will be judgment. So you can see, this whole entire two verses is about describing how the judgment will come. It talks about a dry wind. Here. Of desolate heights. Now verse 11, a dry wind is a clear wind that is going to blow on its course. And at desolate heights blows in the wilderness, there's nothing to block this wind. And, and this is a, well, it, it says here a dry wind. Uh, it would be a hot and dry. I think that would be a, a good way of depicting. Hot and dry. Blowing right across. Nothing is stopping it. And is going toward the daughter of my people, all the people in the land, not to cool them down nor to cleanse them. This will be a wind that is full. That means that it is a wind that is male. It is, it is complete. It, it, is, it comes with its full force. I think that would be a good word to depict. A wind that will be, will be coming in full force. Uh, and it will come to me. Right? Not necessarily for me. To me. And, and, and where will God be? God's location, as we can always tell in Scripture, is Jerusalem. Remember the Mount of Jerusalem, Mount of Jerusalem. And God will speak judgment against them. And everything here is to do with judgment. Now, is, a, is the dry wind bad? Uh, I remember having to tell some of you before about the east wind. Uh, the east wind, and if this be, uh, if this be Israel and this is the sea, and this is the land, all right? The east wind will always blow from this side. And the west wind will blow from this side. And so it is east and west. The east wind will be a dry wind. Dry and hot. 
Now, I remember in uh, 2019, in the month of November, as you know, in the month of November is towards the winter months, and it should be very cool and might be fairly wet because we're talking about the west wind blowing. But when I was there in uh, Israel, uh, they had a ton of winds, and the winds that blew were the east wind. And, and we were there, and we were wearing shorts, and it was very hot, and we couldn't figure that out until somebody explained to us. Because one night, overnight, literally, our skin became parched. Uh, you had to put lotion or moisturizing cream because the entire body, your, your exposed parts, your face, it all kind of shriveled up. And that is the dry and hot wind, which is the east wind. And now God is not talking about the east wind. God is talking about the character of the wind. I just wanted to show you that when this kind of wind blow, it, it, it really, you can really feel it. And so in this case, God says, when this comes, the wind will be too strong and you can't withstand them. Behold, he shall come like clouds, his chariots like whirlwind, his horses are swifter than eagles. Now, mind you, in the Hebrew context, eagles would be the fastest. When God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, God says, I born you on eagles' wings. But here God says his horses are faster than eagles. And then in verse 13, uh, and this is what it means, Oi, to us, for we are plundered. They will take us spoil. And this really depicts unstoppable. Fast, right? And it will be a conquest to a victory. This is what God is warning them. Absolutely. And they couldn't be bothered. Well, that would be the reaction that they have. So at this point in time, uh, let us put a, let us pause here in verse 13. And we will carry on tomorrow until the end of the chapter.